would like to, uh, to thank you for your kind invitation. Um, it, is, it is really an honor for me to, uh, to, to talk to such a distinguished um, audience, and I think the format will, uh, will allow uh, some real discussions, given that it's a, it's a small room and, and, and we are in a, in a more intimate setting than in a, uh, than in a large conference room. Um, what I will try to do is to have um, a short introduction of how the establishment of the European uh, financial supervisors and among them the European Banking Authority came about and I would like to put that into, into a European context um, in, into the process of, of addressing the, uh, the problems that came about in the European financial system uh, during the uh, 2007 and 2009 financial crisis and uh, unfortunately uh, to the context of recent events that are still uh, prevailing in the, in the financial markets in Europe. I think that the, um, that the advantages of financial integration in the European Union and, and even more so in the monetary union of Europe ha has been well documented. Um, the literature in academia and also in, in applied um, research uh, clearly stated that there are many um, advantages of, of creating the single market in Europe in financial services. I would name three advantages uh, that is, I think, applicable to, to all countries and all financial institutions. One was that cross-border activity increased the international diversification of credit risk in the asset books of, 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 of banks. And if it well managed in terms of, of, of risks, it is clearly an advantage for an institution to have a, a well diversified um, asset portfolio. Also on the liability side, the integration increased the, um, the opportunity for banks to go um, in, the, in their funding activities to a more diversified setting and therefore stabilizing their funding uh, structure. And thirdly, there was, um, as a consequence of this integration, there was a, a clear process of transferring knowledge, expertise, governance, uh, and stability across the borders through subsidiaries and, and, and branches um, across the European market. Nevertheless, I think this, um, this process has its own, had its own risks. And it was these risks were revealed in the financial crisis, and I would mention um, a, a few of these um, the, these risks. When the crisis came about, it, it became very apparent that there was a problem of of the regulatory landscape in Europe. Financial institutions who were acting in a global fashion or in a European fashion, in a cross-border fashion, were regulated extremely. Um, um, differently in, in various markets, and unfortunately, this was um, this was used for regulatory arbitrage purposes, and this meant that that some of their activities were not properly regulated and were not properly overseen by the by the financial regulators of their respective um, jurisdictions. Other problems that came about in in the financial crisis was that. Um, that due to their international diversification, their activities became completely interconnected. So if there was a problem emerging in one spot, or in one institution, or in one country, or in one segment of the market, that translated into, uh, into waves of risks very quickly to the entire European financial sector. Now this, um, of course, came, um, brought the recognition that something needs to be done at the European level if we want to preserve the advantages of integration, but we want to reduce the risks associated with this integration. This, um, this brought about the, the setup of the new uh, European financial supervisory framework. I will try to... Just press the middle button. The middle, okay. Okay. So um, what, I will, um, what I will talk about is, um, is a, a little bit of an introduction of the landscape of the supervisory architecture in Europe. Then um, I will go into the details of the functioning of the, of the perceived or, or potential functioning of this new supervisory um, infrastructure. And then um, I, will, I will mention some, um, some topics of, let's say, particular interest um, in, in our activities um, of recent recent month. 
The new institutional arrangements in Europe um, are based on, let's say, two major pillars and four institutions altogether. The one pillar is that a new authority was created for macroprudential oversight of the European financial system. Uh, this is the ESRB. It is, um, it is dominated by central banks. It is, um, the, it, its seat is with the ECB. Its chairman is the, uh, the governor or the, uh, the president of the ECB. And it is, it is, uh, it is functioning there um, to, to look at the European financial system as a whole and try to identify risks that, that, uh, that are, that are uh, threatening the, the entire functioning of the, of the European financial system. The other pillar is the, let's, let's put it this way, the microprudential um, pillar of the, um, of, of the architecture. And this is, uh, this is comprising three institutions, three microprudential authorities that have been created uh, with a sectorial breakdown for the insurance and pension sector, for the banking sector, and for the securities market sector at, at a European level. These institutions, the insurance is seated in Frankfurt, the um, market, the, the securities supervisor is seated in Paris, and the EBA is seated in London. These institutions are there to, um, to provide functions of microprudential nature for the, for the European uh, banking, insurance, and, and securities markets. There is, uh, there is a joint committee that is coordinating between the three, um, the three um, ESAs. They are called the European Supervisory Agencies, the ESAs. And this joint committee is chaired on a rotational basis and it's meeting every, every quarter. So this is the new institutional framework. These new agencies have been recently set up. They started operations from 1st of January this year only. And um, they are relatively small organizations in terms of size just to give you an idea, and then you can compare it or relate it to the national supervisors of, of, of various countries. The EBA, when I started my, my, my job there in April, um, was about um, a team of 30 people. Um, and now we, we have grown to 50, which is in percentage terms, it's a, it's a huge growth, but in, in, in terms of um, manpower, it's still um, a very, very small organization. And I will explain how we are going to grow further and how we are going to perform what we are supposed to do. Okay, what are, what are the objectives of setting up the European, I will talk about the European Banking Authority, but similar lines are, are, uh, are true for the other two. Um, what are the major objectives of setting up this, uh, this new agency? The first one, and I would say this is probably the most important and the most um, obvious one, is to, um, to change the old fashion of European banking regulation from having European directives and then these directives being transposed into national legislations uh, by the national lawmakers, subject to interpretations, subject to, uh, to discretions, subject to variations in, in terms of the approach of, of transposition that resulted into major differences and major regulatory arbitrage opportunities and major under-regulation in the, um, in the uh, pre-crisis um, era. So we, we will be there to ensure that the rules in Europe uh, provide a level playing field and there are single applicable uh, rules uh, throughout the European um, banking community, throughout the European financial markets for, for banks. We are talking about, um, about regulations to approximately 8,000 financial institutions in, in, in Europe altogether. So it, it is a difficult um, uh, job to, to create single rules for all, uh, all of them, irrespective of their size and, and, and type of their business model. The second major objective is to harmonize supervision. The other problem in, 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 in the European financial market, which, was, which became very evident in the crisis, was that not only rules were different, but the enforcement of these rules, the application of these rules were very, very different. And they are still very different. Countries um, in different uh, parts of Europe had a completely different approach of 
policing or supervising their banks and their financial institutions. There were, uh, you, you, you all remember the light touch approach, the principle based approach, um, heavy on site um, approach, uh, different, different frequency of on site visits, different, different ways of, of looking at banks, different resources, level of resources in, 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 in various um, national supervisors that, that, were, um, that were completely um, making it impossible. To, uh, to have the same approach in enforcing the regulation. So that will be, there will be an objective of the European Banking Authority to ensure that from now on, the consistency of supervision and enforcement will be, uh, will be higher. There will be a specific objective of the existence of the EBA is to look at larger cross-border banks and to ensure that they are, um, they are better supervised and their supervision is much stronger than before. The, um, we will have, we will have um, a role in risk <coughs> assessment, in continuous monitoring of risk and, and, and risk assessment in a bottom-up fashion, so it, it is very important, that as opposed to the ESRB's top-down macro, macro prudential um, approach, uh, we will do bottom-up monitoring of the, of the major European players and, and, and try to assess their risks and, and give signals and warnings and, and, and propose action in case we do see something popping up um, in, the, uh, in the various uh, financial institutions and in, in, in various financial markets in Europe. We, the EBA will have a role in um, early intervention and bank resolution or crisis management in general. As we all know, there is, a, there is an upcoming proposal of the European Commission in, in this area it is not yet published, it's not yet out, so we don't uh, quite yet know uh, what exactly the role EBA is going to play under this, new, under this new framework, but it is very clear that there needs to be something at the European level uh, to, um, to allow authorities to, uh, to manage institutions in crisis at a European level in case there are, there are institutions operating at the European level. The EBA does also have a, a relatively modest role in, in consumer protection, and the reason I'm saying relatively modest is because of resources. We, we have to be realistic of what we can achieve in consumer protection at the European level uh, with the resources uh, we have. We do have a mandate, and we will look at issues that are, that are uh, in significance European and we will try to, uh, to, to do something good in consumer protection. It was a last minute addition to the, uh, to the legislation on the, um, on the EBA. <coughs> main objectives, I will, I will talk about that. The main objectives will be that we will develop binding technical standards based on the, on the higher level legislation issued by the European, uh, European Union. So whatever, when CRD4 is going to be adopted, we will be obliged to write pieces of legislation that are called binding technical standards or implementing technical standards that will be, and this is important, these, these pieces of legislation will be applicable directly to all countries in Europe. So whatever comes out of the EBA's drafting table endorsed by the Commission will be directly applicable European regulations in, in, the, in the European Union. Of course, um, if you have questions on how this is going to happen, I will, I will be able to give you the process and the details. Of course, this will involve national supervisors to a great extent. Uh, just to give you a magnitude and idea, we are, we are um, estimating that we would be issuing about 150 pieces of regulations in the next two and a half years um, only on banking. Um, which, which will become um, enforceable and, 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 and observable um, by European financial institutions. Now, just logistically imagine that with a, with a team of our size, without the involvement of the expertise and resources of national supervisors, it would be impossible. So therefore, uh, there is a structure in place which will make uh, the involvement of national supervisors very, very strong. We, we will have to, uh, we, we have got tools to promote the supervisory culture um, across, across um, the European landscape. We have got a very strong role in, in, um, in monitoring and, and, and taking part in colleges, in international um, banks, colleges. Um, we do European-wide risk assessment. 
One example of that was the stress test, but we will do continuous risk monitoring um, and, and assessment of, of risks um, on an ongoing basis. The, the, the European stress test, I think it's a well-publicized um, exercise. Uh, it was, um, it was uh, uh, involving Irish banks as well, and it was, uh, it was well published in, in, um, in Ireland, so I don't uh, want to go into details in this introductory remark. Uh, we will have um, a role of reacting to risk warnings that are coming from the ESRB. So if the ESRB uh, provides some sort of a, a, a warning that has got implications on, on the microprudential supervision of individual institutions, then we will follow up on these, on these warnings and we will contact national authorities and, and, um, and, um, and take the necessary steps to address these warnings. We will... Um, we will we will have powers to handle emergency situations. I must say that this is, this is untested water. We have, not, we have not done that. We have not had an emergency situation declared yet, but we have got, uh, we might, I mean, we might have um, at some point in, in, in time. Um, there was a long discussion on what an emergency situation is. The, um, the conclusion in the regulation is that such an emergency situation needs to be declared by the European Council. So it's heads of states will declare an emergency situation under which we would have um, in increased powers to act even uh, on individual institutions, which we normally don't have. We've, in consumer protection, we will, have, uh, we will have a role to monitor developments in the markets, uh, identify trends that can be risky from a consumer pr uh, perspective, and in extreme situations, again, we, will, we even have the power to stop the distribution of certain products in the European market, but that's, that's, an extreme, uh, that's an extreme situation. I must say that we have already had the first question uh, coming from the political side of what the first candidate of a product is that we want to stop being distributed in Europe, um, and unfortunately we don't have that that yet, so it, it, will, it will take time until we reach to um, that, that stage in, in, our, um, in our operations. Um, I will, I've got a few slides, and of course I will leave this, uh, this with you uh, later on, but that was the most important, I think that was the most important um, slide. Um, I, I think I've explained the single rule book concept, uh, which is, a, which is a, a marked change from the, from the old um, way of regulating financial sector in, in, in Europe. Only for Basel III implementation we are expecting to issue more than 40 standards very, very soon. We are, uh, we are trying to gear up for this. The process of creating these standards will be such that under the EBA's umbrella there will be working groups for each and every technical standards involving the experts from the EBA and involving the experts of national authorities, which in Ireland's case, it's the uh, National Bank of uh, the Central Bank of Ireland, and these working groups will be doing the drafting, and then this drafting uh, will go to an approval process within the EBA. As you know, the main governing body of the EBA is the Board of Supervisors, which is a 27-member um, body comprising the heads of banking supervision in the 27-member countries. So there will be member state control on what is, being, uh, what is being approved and adopted. And then once it's finalized, it goes to public consultation and impact assessment, which will all be transparent and public. And finally, uh, when the final draft is ready, then the European Commission is supposed to endorse it under its delegated powers. And once it's endor endorsed, it will become directly applicable to, uh, to the European market. So it's a very, it's a very heavy process. Um, and, and we have to do it for every single regulation uh, which will be issued under this, um, under this process. The, um, I mentioned, I mentioned the, the oversight function of the, of the EBA. Uh, we, have, we have touched upon all, all, these, um, all these elements. We will go to colleges. We will do a continuous risk assessment. We will develop risk dashboards which will be communicated to the national um, authorities. And we will do, occasionally, we will do stress testing. I do get the question very frequently from, from, from the media, how often we do the stress test. It is not in our regulation. It is not defined in our regulation. It just says we, we are supposed to do regular stress testing exercises. 
um, and, and there is no decision on the next one yet, but it, it is reasonable to expect that we will do one probably every, every year. Uh, again, it's not, it's not written, it's not carved in stone. Um, one, one area I want to, uh, to, to, to touch upon is the, the, the colleges. The experience we had under the predecessor organization under SEPS, which was a member organization of national supervisors, was when, when SEPS sent visitors or observers to the colleges of international banks, was that, that the, the quality and the way of operation of these colleges um, were, were quite different. So not only the rules were different, but the way international banks were supervised were different. I can, also, I can also say that what we experienced in the crisis, that colleges that are, that are the, 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 the forum for supervising internationally active, active banks, they had a very smooth operation when business was good. <coughs> but when crisis came, their functioning um, worsened. Their, 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 their quality of functioning um, was going down. And the, the reason was because, because there was uh, the, the, the confidence between national supervisors in sharing information and sharing decisions and sharing risk assessments across groups that were operating across the borders um, collapsed when the, when the crisis came. So I, I, could, I could say that there is there is a lot to do with respect to, uh, to, to colleges of supervisors to, to, ensure, to ensure that the way they function, the, the way they perform their duty of looking at international banks with the involvement of many national supervisors in some cases should be standardized and protocols should be established and these protocols should be maintained even in the case of a crisis. And there should be a discussion between, between the supervisors on the risks and the, the, the business of the respective uh, financial institutions. We did experience similar, similar um, differences in, in, in the course of the stress test of this year, for example, when we looked at how home country supervisors communicated the, the, the stress test results to the host country supervisors in the, in the colleges prior to publication. We did see some very good examples where full information sharing was in, in place, and we did see some, uh, let's say, less um, encouraging examples where information was not that readily shared with the, with the, with the community of, of, of supervisors involved in the supervision of one or two particular groups. So where, where we want to um, go a lot deeper is to ensure that this is um, the, the way this is happening is more um, is more harmonized, is more standardized, and the appropriate protocols are developed and they are they are respected. We of course uh, have to stress that according to the current rules, according to the current legislation, the supervision of individual financial institutions remained with the national authorities. So the EBA is not conducting. Uh, direct supervision of individual financial institutions in, um, at, at, at this stage, but we, we have a mandate to ensure that the way these individual institutions are supervised on an international basis is harmonized and it's, it's uniform. And we, we will do that through the colleges. Um, uh, and it's given that there are more than 100 colleges in Europe, you can imagine what sort of, uh, what sort of task we have only to send one person to every college meeting to every single college. That's, uh, that's already um, something of a, of a resource intensive um, um, job. We, um, I, I will not go into, into, uh, into the details. I think uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the continuous risk assessment, there is a little bit of a technical um, description on the slides of how this is, um, this is done. With respect to the EU-wide stress test of banks, um, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, we, this was the first time we, we conducted the stress test exercise under the new EBA uh, logo. The, 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 the stress test in the prior year, in 2010, was a different exercise. It was, uh, it was, it was done under SEPs without uh, SEPs having 
um, regulatory powers. Um, we, at the moment, we are in the process of, of doing the lessons learned, learned exercise within, within the EBA with the involvement of the, um, of the supervisors who participated um, in, in the exercise. And, of course, we will propose improvements um, for, for next year, although we clearly see that this year's exercise was, 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 was clearly um, much improved compared to 2010, and the market perception and reception of the exercise was, uh, was much, more, um, much more positive. Uh, so we, I, I think um, we, we have made a major step ahead, and, and, and we, will, uh, we will try to make another step uh, next time we do, we do the exercise. In terms of consumer protection, we, we have a mandate to monitor market developments. So if, for example, I just, let, let's just make one example which is now very highly publicized. Um, th there is this case of, of PPI insurance mis-selling related to, uh, to mortgage loans in a number of countries. We, um, if something like that happened today, at a European level, in a multiple of countries, we, uh, we would be supposed to spot that and, and give a warning in advance and not, um, not go into a situation when such mis-selling ha has to be rectified years after, uh, after it happened. So we, 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 would, we would need to look at market trends. Unfortunately, right now we have very little capacity to do so, so we rely on national authorities but we will need to build up some capacities to, uh, to, to do this. We are also, we are also um, cooperating in this respect with the other two agencies. For example, one obvious case for, um, for, for monitoring is, to, is, the, is, is, is the package retail investment products, which are sold under structured deposit label, are sold under different uh, funds label, and are also sold under different life insurance policies label, but essentially they are the same products, the same risk, and they are sold under, under different labels in different sectors, and there are consumer, there could be consumer issues in, in there, so we are doing some, some cooperation uh, in, in this respect with the other two agencies. Again, um, caveat is, is, is resources um, on, on, on this. We are also um, um, mandated to develop disclosure rules for, uh, for retail investors. Some countries are more advanced, some, uh, some other countries are less advanced in this. Uh, some countries have had bad experience in, um, in, in, in the sale process of various financial products because of under-information or misinformation of, of, of especially retail clients. Some countries um, have already um, progressed very well on, on rectifying these. Uh, so I think with the with the involvement of the EBA, we will be able to uh, to um, to build on the experience of various countries and to uh, to reach something um, of a higher level at the European um, at the European level. Again, we do have the power to constrain the distribution of of, of products under extre extreme scenarios. Um, of course, for that we would need to earn the reputation of, of an institution that that is uh, that has got the authority. To, to pinpoint, identify uh, such a product and then, then make the move and, and restrict the distribution. And, and even if we do, do, if we do restrict the distribution of certain products, that is, uh, that is subject to regular reviews and we cannot just maintain or abuse this power um, indefinitely without proper justification. Individual complaints handling um, remains with national authorities. Um, this is a difficult area. We, we have started receiving individual complaints. What is interesting is not only from the European Union, but also outside of the European Union, even outside of Europe. Uh, people um, write to, uh, to, to us in, in, in emails uh, complaining about their mistreatment in, in, in financial services. And that, of course, uh, given that we are a very transparent organization and my personal email is on the website, it, it, is, um, it is sometimes um, um, a, a difficult job because as an EU institution, of course, we have to, um, we have to reply to, uh, to, uh, to inquiries that, that, that come, uh, come in. 
and we, we sometimes find it very difficult to, uh, to cope with that in, in terms of the, the numbers. So we, uh, again, we, we stress that individual complaints are, are still to be dealt with uh, primarily with the national authorities. Um, the one area where we do have, uh, do have uh, jurisdiction and mandate to act is when there is a suspicion or, or there is a case of breaching of EU law in, in, uh, in financial sector regulation. That, that in itself is a difficult uh, call because uh, when a complaint comes in, just to make a judgment whether it, it has got an element of breach of EU law is, is, a, is, a, legal, is a legal challenge um, uh, altogether. So um, it's, um, it's, not, it's not without, uh, without difficulties um, even these days. This is, um, this is roughly what the, uh, what the EBA's mandate is. Um, again, rulemaking, oversight, and consumer protection, the three uh, pillars of our activities. I would say, I would summarize that the role of the EBA in rulemaking is very clear. It's very clearly defined. Um, it, it, it's very straightforward. The role in oversight um, is I would say given that we rely on the individual supervision of institutions by national authorities, it's less, um, it's less centralized in a, in a European context. And in terms of consumer protection, um, we, uh, given the resource intensity of this activity, we will, we will be able to do relatively, I say relatively uh, little in the, in, the, in the coming few years in, in, in this area. Nevertheless, we, we have to, uh, we have to uh, take steps there.